May 25th, 2020. The day George Floyd was killed during an arrest in Minneapolis. A death that sparked conversation nationwide on racial inequality and injustice. As many states and cities throughout the U.S. held protests in honor of Floyd, including right here in Bakersfield. While sports are still on pause here in Kern County, the conversation on these issues didn't have to be. So for the first time ever, I invited a group of local coaches to the Fox Theater in downtown Bakersfield to have a raw and honest discussion on race. Here's that conversation. Welcome into a 23 ABC News special we're calling Out of Bounds. It's a conversation on racial inequality and injustice. And I'm your host, Carrie Osa, but of course, I brought together a diverse group of men, local coaches from all around Kern County. So let's get into who we brought to the table. At first, we have CSUB women's basketball coach, Greg McCall. We also have CSUB men's basketball coach, Rod Barnes. And then we have Liberty head football coach, Brian Nixon. Bakersfield College head football coach R. Todd Littlejohn, Foothill Boys basketball coach Wes Davis, Bakersfield High School football coach Michael Stewart, head boys basketball coach at Bakersfield Christian Garrett Brown, and finally rounding out our table, we have the head football coach at Highland High School, Michael Gutierrez. And I want to start off by saying thank you so much for all of you being open to join me at the table and have an open discussion on what many deem an uncomfortable conversation, but a necessary one. So with that, I want to start with a broad question for all of you, but how has race impacted you? It's obvious that, uh, you know, there is a difference based on your skin color which is quite unfortunate, but if I'm being completely honest, um, I graduated from Liberty High School in 2003. Um, and when I went there, I was one of eight to 10 black kids there. Um, I grew up in Southwest Bakersfield uh, near West High School area at that time where it was predominantly uh, black. I seen a lot of people like myself and making that transition into what is considered Rosedale, uh, my eyes began to get open a little bit but also at the same time as I was growing up into a, a young man, um, I can remember making a statement to my father that, uh, man, it seems like racism is no longer around. And I say that for this reason, uh, you see a lot of biracial cu couples kind of during my time period. Um, biracial uh, couples or just interracial couples started really being prominent. Um, and then fast forward to the year 2020, um, we see just racism just really in our faces. Uh, but for me specifically, I've dealt with uh, racism while applying for jobs, interviewing for jobs that I knew I was qualified for. I'm sure many of you as well have felt that you've missed the job based on the color of your skin. Um, so that's, that's my personal experience. Um, I definitely love to hear from the rest. So I've been around the game of basketball my whole life. So I've been around African-Americans my, my entire life. My wife is an African-American woman. Uh, my kids are interracial children. Um, you know, we're both in law enforcement. So everything that's going on in this world today has, has really impacted both of us uh, in an immense way. You know, um, you know th this is what we do for a living and it pays our bills. But at the same time, you know, I have to have a conversation with my son on how he must act in front of law enforcement if something happens later on in life. And, you know, just having that conversation and speaking out about it right now just makes me emotional. You know, I, I have to have that conversation with my kids and, you know, it's just, a, it's just a tough thing to deal with. Kind of have a unique thing. I was born in a Tascadero. So at the time it was literally five black families. One that's my own and, and the other one was my grandparents, uh, three other families and three elementaries. But all my best of friends growing up until fifth grade when I moved to Bakersfield would have been white or, you know, Anglo. And so had a different perspective growing up, uh, coming here and going to Fremont, uh, then going to school with a lot of my black and brown brothers. And that was like a cultural shock of getting used to that. And, you know, that's when you had to learn how to start getting the nucks up and learning how to take care of yourself, not get ran right. home. Uh, but graduating from Bakersfield High, again, a diverse uh, population, 
and I'm sure Coach Lil John will chime in at some point. You know, we go way back, but we've had a lot of encounters together, uh, positive and negative, with law enforcement. We were cadets at the Bakersfield PD, but my mom is from the South, so she let us know early on if you're ever stopped by police, you don't run, you don't do certain things, uh, yes sir, no sir. Uh, again, just to be able to learn how to have a, a positive interaction. When we did work at, at the police department, we visually saw some things, we learned some things as well, because we, we became friends with some of the officers, you know, and, and it's disappointing, I think, for all of us to understand too, especially when you have a football team, you can have one player that doesn't do right, but then it, it the perception of all the football players, you know, so similar to law enforcement, you can have one that may, you know, not do the right thing, and, and now it pertains to everybody, and I think that's unfortunate. I think for me, I've just always tried to have an open mind about people in general and judge them on them, not necessarily, you know, their, their skin color and, and try to educate, I think, more than anything. Interested for Coach Barnes and Coach McCall, two men who grew up in the South and have a different experience, what was that transition in terms of gearing up for Kern County and Bakersfield, and how has that been different from your perspective racially from growing up in the South to moving here? You kind of knew exactly where you stood. You know, you had black, you had pretty much, you know, black and white. Um, and we knew exactly where we could go and where we couldn't go. You know, certain buildings, they would have the Confederate flag. You're like, oh, that can't go in that place. That's one building I can't go into. And so it was like that there. And so certain restaurants and things like that. So you just kind of, you know, stage your where you needed to be in your comfort zone. And when you did, you knew what to do and how to act. Obviously being an African-American, uh, raised in Mississippi, uh, even a difference from Coach McCall. Uh, where I came from was really a lot like Bakersfield. Uh, we were uh, ag, uh, farm, land, uh, so we had a lot of different kinds of people that worked. Uh, most of the people that were the bosses uh, were white. Uh, most of the people that worked alongside African Americans was Hispanics. But my father taught me early on, uh, judge people as for who they are, for their character. So that's something that I've always done. Uh, when I talk about my friends, I started with a white friend. We played baseball together. So obviously as the coaches around this table realize, you don't see color in those instances. But then right after that, my best friend was a Hispanic. and He played basketball with me. So all of a sudden, I, I never, uh, I knew the difference because we were taught uh, from a young age of you know, how to handle yourself, uh, how to deal with not only just the police, but just society in general. You know, one of the things Coach Barnes mentioned was the great thing about sports is, you know, you don't really see the color of the skin or you don't really identify that stuff because you're out there as a team. And I think for me, I was fortunate as a young age of, you know, my parents let me play sports and I really didn't uh, see color. I grew up in Northeast Bakersfield, had black, brown, white friends. Um, and it wasn't until I started getting older when I realized that I was, you know, always kind of being labeled by, you know, one group or another, not brown enough, not white enough. And there were certain things that, you know, maybe, you know, people would take, you know, slights at me or things because I couldn't fit a certain category. And you know racism, racism's around it. And I mean, I've seen it on multiple different fronts, whether through friends, uh, through our athletes. We can't say and act like it doesn't exist because it truly does. And it's something that I think as a coach, you know, we have to talk to our players about and really make everyone aware of that, you know, the inequalities that are going on, but also, you know, that we really got to be there to help each other and support each other. I don't have the experiences that these guys have had. And some of my best friends were, were Hispanic kids. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity of playing sports my entire life, which that opened a lot of doors and opened my eyes to a lot of things that educated me in a lot of ways. I just try to educate myself as best I can to be able to educate our kids. And we're talking about human beings. We aren't talking about anything else other than a human being. And how can we get these kids to understand what we try to do daily is to get them fight for a common goal on our team. So why can't we get them to fight for a common goal in the world? Yes. What I love is the respect that each of you, coming from diverse backgrounds, coming from diverse racial backgrounds as well, you all are coming to this table and having this conversation. So we just heard how race impacts these men. Coming up next, we'll find out how it impacts their athletes.
Welcome back to this 23 ABC News special, Out of Bounds. So we brought together some men that love coaching, and I know why. You want to inspire young athletes and not only encourage them on the field or on the court, but beyond that. So I know that this topic is very important for all of you. How do you feel that this widespread national conversation has impacted your athletes? I'm trying to be correct, say, but we had an uneducated uh, young man at Bakersfield Christian High School who put something up on his Zoom recently um, that said black lives don't actually matter. Um, so that that whole first day when it came out, um, I was livid. And, you know, I, I took that whole first day to contact all of my black kids and their parents and to make sure that they were okay with everything. And then I took that next day to really think about what my next move was. And I talked to my father on the phone for about an hour, um, talked to my wife for about an hour, and, and I was ready to step down if it wasn't handled correctly. And thankfully, our administration handled it the right way, and I was able to put my kids at ease and my kids' parents at ease, and we're moving forward. So. You know, it, it obviously it's a national conversation that's being had. It, it's something that's happening on a national stage, but it, it happened at the school that I coach at. And that was really tough for me um, because it goes against everything that I believe in. And it goes against all my values and everything that's been instilled in me my whole life. How do you guys take on that kind of pressure to make sure that your, your athletes feel comfortable in their space of education and competing? Incident happened with George Floyd. It was a tough one for myself. It was a tough one for my players. Um, and we had a long Zoom call. Um, it was the one that was really, really emotional for myself, my coaching staff, and as well as for my players because we have a diverse group as well too. And we have a couple of our players, that, you know, white players that say, hey, we, we just don't understand, you know, and but we feel what you guys are feeling. We feel the love. And it just really brought our team a whole lot closer um, because of that um, and it didn't spread them out and that's something that you really admire about you know my team and that's the people that I want around me and these are the players that I want to play for me because of the way that they are you know we bring them here as young girls and then they we want to see them walk across the stage black or white Hispanic um, we have a young lady that's biracial um, so we want to see them walk across the stage as ladies and be productive citizens in society and knowing that they have been well educated and been well taken care of. And so it, it was a, something that's really, really important to me to make sure that these parents understand that I'm going to take care of them. You guys all have athletes who don't look like you and who come from different backgrounds. So how do you each make an effort for those players to feel comfortable even if they don't, and especially at a time like this when this conversation of race is so heavy on our country. Our teams know at Highland that we're very careful throwing out the word family because I think it's such an easy term to throw around with teams, but ultimately you, you want it to be that way. And I think when you build that relationship, you build that trust, you can have these conversations. And having you know, uh, students from all different backgrounds, um, it's gonna affect them differently. And I know for us, when we I pulled our platoon leaders in, uh, when the George Floyd thing happened and you know, I asked him, hey, how, how do we go about talking this? Do we want to do a full team thing? Do we need to have coaches? You know, what do you want to go about it? And it, it was very interesting just to see uh, kind of their perspective of that. For some, they understood what was going on. Some, you still saw the innocence of kids that they were so worried about their video games that they weren't paying attention to some of the news. And then when it gets brought to them, they realize, man, some people go through some different things than I do. And so I think as we had those conversations, um, making it clear that, you know, yes, you're gonna hear people talking, but the key is to be listening. As much diversity and racism and things that are going on, when you talk about team and bringing all these different, whether it's economics, I didn't grow up on this street, that street, once you get this ideal of being a teammate and how that you have to count on each other, I, I feel that just really spreads over. And so we, we want our athletes to uh, not take it lightly that they are a positive impact person on the campus in their community. 
So we have two coaches here. You guys were the first African-American head football coaches at your schools. So I know that that weighs on you. There's, you know, an impact you're immediately having for athletes of color who get to look at a coach who looks like them. So Coach Little John, you being one of them at Bakersfield College, you know, I know this is an important conversation for you for that reason. And you've been the one coach on a staff who is the one coach of color. So how are you using this to make sure that your athletes at BC feel comfortable and feel recognized? Junior college is a little bit different dynamics because you are combining you know, young men from, from all over the country. The time spent there could be six months or three years. You know, and so you don't have the luxury of a four-year school or a high school where you can actually watch them grow. So you're trying to implement things literally in a hurry. First team meeting that I had um, with him back in the spring, picked out a couple guys here or there, and I said, you know, tell me two things unfootball related about him. You can tell me. So I went around the room and I told him, I said, we're never breaking with family or brotherhood or anything until you actually learn about that individual. Because once you then start to know outside of football, now you're going to be more apt to support them. You may find a lot of things that you have in common and how you've grown up. We're afraid of conversations, even within a team sometimes. That's why, to me, sports is so powerful. Yeah. So we talk about, it, and Coach said, it, we have sessions about a kid from Mississippi, how different he is from a kid from, from Philadelphia. See, a lot of people want to put us in a group, in a race. And, and we're the human race. And, and there's black people that are the same as white people. And there's white people that are the same as Hispanic people. As far as what they've been taught and the mentality that they have. And, and, and we, we discuss that here. Because a lot of the things that we're talking about, we're saying the same thing. And, and we've witnessed that, whether that was through our kids or through the kids that we coach, uh, racism in different levels, and we're always trying to educate them, and we're trying to teach them. I think every coach here is about equality. Yeah. It's about justice and about fairness. The issue is is sometimes we're in areas of community that no one else is teaching it or no one else is talking about it. And that's why this conversation is so important, and this conversation needs to be taken not only just as coaches, but in every area of influence in this community. Yeah, I just wanted to start with coaches because you guys are my guys, but you know, <laughs> okay. but of course, I have this conversation in mind with Wes Davis in mind to start off. So coach Hang Tight is coming up after the break. We're gonna start with a question for you. We're gonna take a look at if these men believe that there is a racial divide in Kern County. Welcome back to this 23 ABC News special, Out of Bounds. So before the break, I told you we were gonna talk about Kern County as a whole. And so I gotta start with the man who has a little bit of a tie to Kern County and Bakersfield, you could say, Mr. Wes Davis. So coach, I gotta ask you, do you feel that Kern County is dealing with any sort of racial divide? When we begin talking about Kern County, it's unfortunate because the current events in the United States have forced us to be able to really begin to see that, yeah, we do have an issue here. And in this situation where racism is rearing its ugly head up, you would hope that people would say, this is an issue we have to deal with. As coaches, we go to the film, and if we see our centers, our big people in basketball are having an issue, we're gonna devote more time to them. If we see our little guys are having an issue, we're gonna devote more time than them for football coaches. If it's the O-line or the D-line or the DBs, head coach is not gonna just let DB coach work with them. Head coach is gonna get over there too. Hey, we gotta get these guys together, right? Because there's an issue. So when we started talking about where Kern County is now, it, it broke my heart to see when the protesting was going on in the city that we decide, that there was another group of people that decided to protest against the protesters. If you just let that sink in, we're protesting against the protesters who are protesting that someone lost their life. 
that's never okay. As coaches, we embrace the opportunity to be able to teach the young people that this is right, this is wrong. As a lot of people mentioned, sports have brought them in contact with many people of many different ethnicities, colors, races, and they've been able to unite. If I see one of you guys hurting or something, it's my job and duty and obligation to say, let me empathize with Coach Nixon. You know, because we take it in coaching, if I got a difficult kid and he's played for someone else, I'm gonna call the other coach, hey, how'd you get through to this guy? You know, because I need to be able to get through to this guy. But the one language that helps with that is love. Mm. I can go any room in the United States and I ain't got to speak the same language with somebody. But if I give a warm handshake, and I learned it from Coach Barnes, I don't think he knows that. <laughs> he don't give hand, regular handshakes to his players. <laughs> he always bring them in. <laughs> and when you do that to people, people feel embraced. You know, we call it the bro hug. The bro hug just make you feel close. But if we put that love out there, all this ugly bull crap goes away. And I pray and hope every day that the people in Kern County that are filling themselves with the hatred of people of another color will get rid of those things. Because we got a lot of young people. I got a daughter, she's 17. And I want her to be able to move into this world where it's all love. Nixon said it, he's got little kids. That's what we all want. We want our kids, our grandbabies, our nieces and nephews to be able to move into a world where, man, I'm respected for the human being that I am, the contents of my character and nothing else. For you as a coach, I know your focus is always on your team, but do you notice in the stands here in this county, does it look like there is a divide? Or do you see, like we all say, sports unites people? Like I'm curious for your different perspectives, what are you noticing in those stands? I think sports does unite people. I'm, I don't ever look in the stands when I'm coaching anyway. I know you're so busy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be honest He's with you busy there. Pointing. I'm not turning around. But, um, uh, just to bounce off, it's, uh, it's a humbling thing to be able to listen and learn. I think that's the, the first step in us getting better is listening and learning. Um, mm. I haven't spoke a lot because I haven't had a lot to share. But going off of love, um, we talk to our kids, I'm going to coach you hard, but I'm going to love you harder. I tell our parents that. I say, I'm going to coach your kid hard, but I'm going to love him harder. I think our kids know that. I think our kids know that our coaches love them. And we do this thing. We haven't been able to do it because of COVID, but we always go on a retreat every year at the end of the school year. And we sit around a campfire. And everybody gets a chance to talk. They get to know each other. Mm -hmm. They get to break walls down. And it doesn't matter what house you live in, what car you drive, if the color of your skin, what your religion is, they talk about them as a human being. And Carrie, I think one of the issues in general, and when you look at Kern County, my dad's great-grandfather was a slave. It's not very long ago. Mm -hmm. And I think people are afraid to have conversations because they're afraid of what their history and legacy in their family was. Hmm. Because now they don't want to be identified with their family in a negative manner. And it's sad, but that's the truth. We're identifying with it in the fact that, I mean, slavery, you learn about what it is and, and you, as they say, you learn about history to not repeat it. I've been fortunate. Um, I coached out at Taft College, and uh, it was different. And everybody that's from this area knows about Taft. <laughs> <laughs> and Taft is considered one of the most, supposed to be one of the most racist cities um, in Kern County. And I, uh, I was one, I was fortunate to be the first black uh, coach out there at Taft College for the women's team out there. I went around that city all different times at, at night because um, we used to get back late from games. And I used to have my kids with me. Sometimes Erica wanted to go to practice. No matter how late it was, she still wanted to go. There were times when Justin wanted to go. And it was one of those things where, you know, I was afraid for them at times, but I knew that, you know, it was something that we had to kind of overcome that fear. And fortunate, you know, I've never had an issue out at Tab. It was one of those things that was fortunate. I, I did have a couple of my players just know to say that, hey, they got called the N-word, and it was unfortunate, and I just had to talk to them about those things. Um, but for me,
Kern County, um, I can honestly say, you know, I've had nothing but love from Kern County on both sides. You know, I go over, play with the West over in the hood with the guys, and then I can come back over to Cal State and on my side of town, and I can communicate with anybody over there. But I know that it still does exist. Don't get me wrong. I know one time I was taking student athletes home after a game, and um, you know we got pulled over, and we were never told why we were pulled over. Just the fact that we knew what it was that they, we had, you know, two blacks, two Mexicans in the car, and including myself, and kept asking who was on probation, who was, you know, getting in trouble that night. No reason. I think it's. I know one of our coaches, you know, mentioned of. Unfortunately, it's one, one sour apple now gives this bad persona um, to an establishment that has worked hard to you know, help people out and protect people. So um, I, I think continue to have conversations is very important, not just now, but in the future too. But it all starts with that relationship and the trust that you build with your teams. I was talking to my, my kids about, you know, hey, especially my sons, hey, if you get pulled over, this is what you need to do because I've been experienced in that, you know. Make sure you Say like you said to the officers, yes, no, no ma'am, yes ma'am, you know, yes sir, no sir. I buy by all their rules. Um, and my son told me, uh, Justin, like, hey, but dad, you know, what if I do all of that and they still don't listen, they still shoot me, but I did everything I was supposed to do. And it hurt me. And it still does hurt because I don't have an answer to really give him. So it puts some things in perspective for me here in Kern County because I know that that did happen to me a couple times here. And but it was one of those things I abided and I went on by my way, but I did have encounter some racial things and, and stuff like that with the police officers here. But the thing that with me now, my son got a ticket. I was just happy that he was able to drive away with the ticket. I wasn't mad about the ticket mm. anymore. Those things happen now. And if he can drive away with the ticket, we can deal with that. I can't deal with the fact that if something happens to my son or to my kids, they don't get to come home because of that. That's hurtful. Let them come home. I'd rather see them come home with a ticket. I'd rather see them come home with a muddy face because they made them lay down on the ground. I'd rather see them to be able to do that versus me not seeing them ever again because of something that they were fighting by. And Coach Brown, you touched uh, law enforcement is in your family. Mm -hmm. How do you feel with these issues brought to the table, <clears throat> Kern County can take a step forward in making sure that there is more equality, especially with that divide we're feeling right now with police force and people of color? One of the things that I don't agree with is the whole defund the police movement. I feel like, if anything, the police need more funding for more training, for being able to have more training to have uh, better training on how to deal with people of, of other races and, and really putting people in those positions that, that have the training. For instance, I work at Juvenile Hall and I work for the probation department. We are the only law enforcement agency in Kern County that requires a college education, yet we are the least paid. Mm. That makes zero sense wow. to me. So wow. not only that, we Can just- Can you repeat that? We are the only law enforcement agency in Kern County that requires some sort of college education, yet we are the least paid. <laughs> and you know, we, we just need the, these police forces and law enforcement agencies need more training on how to deal with certain situations and how to deal with people that don't look like them and how there needs to be more funding and so things like this don't happen. Because right now it's just not a job that people want to go into. I, I tell black people all the time, we need, we need us to get into law enforcement. Opportunities like that happen, we've got to get in it. But for these conversations, man, we are so fortunate right now that we have coach here. We have coach here. We have coach here. And I say that because we have coaches here at this conversation right now that are not black. That's the power. Yeah. That, that's the power right there. We have you guiding this conversation. Why? Because we need people of not black ethnicity to be able to go back and be able to tell others that look like them 
that's not right. When I went to Liberty, man, that was life changing for me. Why? And I'm sure your, your young black athletes say the same thing, because we had never dealt with white folk on that level. It was always that, hey man, you know, whites can be, but I met a lot of good white brothers and sisters at Liberty that I still talk to, to this day. I go to a friend's, Andrew Silberberg's from Liberty, and his dad them had pheasant. Black folk, we eat chicken. <laughs> and I tell you, that pheasant was so good, <laughs> to this day I still eat it. <laughs> I've never had pheasant. Oh, it's good. <laughs> good <breath. laughs> Some good eating. <laughs> hey, well, I love that you guys are bringing this conversation into how we can take steps forward and continue changing the world for better. So uh, coming up after the break, we're going to continue the conversation and see how these men can take this conversation back to their teams. Welcome back to this 23ABC special presentation, Out of Bounds. We're continuing this conversation on racial inequality and diversity. And of course, I talked about we're having a fantastic, powerful conversation right now, but how do we bring this conversation to the locker rooms and continue this not only in Kern County, but of course for the important people in your life, your athletes and your teams? Sometimes uh, we, we take for granted that the young people we coach are educated. You know, if we go up, I think about you know, uh, my middle school, elementary school, even high school, there was not a whole lot talked about even with social injustice. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we're trying to uh, talk and, and, and find solutions for those people that are not educated on those things. So I think it's important uh, to try to sit down and take some goals or some action steps in helping our young people, whether that comes from the standpoint of first getting them and educating them on vote. Uh, if you want to bring about change of, of what we're going to do to other things from, from teaching them, uh, as Garrett, which Coach Brown just said, you know, I've got plenty of players that come through. We, we never talk about getting in, involved uh, in, in enforcement, and that's something that I, I, I'm going to talk about. And I told our team, and we agreed upon it, that once we get out of the COVID, uh, we've been going to the east side because there's a lot of kids on the east side that are needed, that are unserved. And, and, and sometimes we don't come to the west side because those are people that a lot of them already are educated, already have things. But then to understand how to deal with each other, there has to be an interaction. And, and we have, we've been going to the east side, we're gonna to continue to go to the east side. So they told me, coach, what can we do? And I said, we're gonna to go to the west side. Mm. So they know what a black athlete look like. And we're able to sit down and talk to a white kid to let them know they have no reason to be afraid. If they haven't been taught in their home, then we get an opportunity to try for a few minutes to educate them that we are okay. And you mentioned the East Side, so Coach Gutierrez, you're representing the East Side. And of course, you have a very diverse team and just a student body at Highland High School. So ha have you had these conversations already? I think you mentioned that before. And what have those conversations looked like? Because you're dealing with high schoolers or young athletes. What have you learned from them and what are they talking about? With the distance learning, I think one of the advantages is you have time to have these conversations that I think you may forget to have at other times or you may get so focused on when you're in season you know, the, the actual football aspect of it. So we're able to now, you know, go through Zoom and, you know, we just talked the other day of, you know, talking to our platoon leaders of, hey, make sure you actually facilitate your room well um, of as we go through breakout rooms and just go through just different topics. And it may be something uh, related to this, or it may be, I think it was Coach Barnes or Coach Little John, one of them mentioning about, you know, just getting to know your teammates well. Um, and I think that then allows these conversations to happen because it goes back to the trust and the relationship that you build uh, where now there's um, a comfort to have it and now it's easier to see from someone's perspective because you know them or you know what they've gone through um, that maybe you realize, man, I didn't even think that happened because you know I've, I've had this so well or you know I thought I was the only one that went through this situation. Um, so I, I think it's important to continue to have those so it, it one, makes your team closer, but also it truly does do what we're here for, to educate people on what's going on in the world and um, with, with racial inequality and, and making sure that people understand that we all have a part 
to help make this change and that we can do it by being there for each other and really learning uh, you know what, what we're all going through and, and how we can navigate through this to, to really make this world a better place because I think that, that's our goal as coaches to leave these guys as better young men than we get them. That's one point though is that the distractions are gone and not that sports are always a distraction but these important conversations are happening so how have you guys felt that that's been a benefit during the quarantine and during you know the pause on sports to have these important tough conversations? In high school I graduated in 83 uh, but there was a school called North High at the time that was pretty much, I'm going to say, 100% probably white. So I remember Coach Briggs, he would literally stop the bus on the way over and he would say, okay, guys, we're heading into enemy territory. Yeah. But he said they're going to have Driller Killer on the helmet and some would have NK on the helmet. And so literally, we kind of knew, like, hey, man, we're going into this different territory. But yet we graduated, and the very next year we're all at BC, and all these kids that, like, looking at you crazy, I'm looking at you, <laughs> we became, like, the best of friends. And it was because we got exposed to a different set of people, different culture, and it wasn't what you heard. So I think this is what is allowing us, even when this time uh, – to get exposure in this situation, unfortunately, how it's come about, it's forcing people to have to deal with what it is uh, more just on an aggressive level, I guess. Uh, and so hopefully we can just continue to have discussions because I, I feel that if we just get exposed mm -hmm. to each other, uh, a lot of these things will just kind of go away on its own. Maybe not overnight, but you've got to be able to get in a room and, and have some exposure. Yeah, how active have you felt like your athletes have been on this discussion since you know we've been on this pause during COVID? All of our athletes are active because they have social media. That's the big kicker here. So we're charged as men to be, once again, the leaders of men and leaders of young women. Um, and with that, we must be vulnerable. Um, Greg can tell you, I have conversations, I think the majority of my conversations with the kids I've been blessed to coach are not even basketball related. I talk about being a husband. I talk about, you know, man, when your wife is tripping, it's how you handle it. Hey, you watch know. yourself. Right. Um, but it's about being vulnerable. Yeah. Yes. It's about being vulnerable. I want my players to be able to see me when I'm happy, see me when I'm sad. They've got to be able to see it all um, because if not, then they're not gonna have, know how to deal with this thing called life, you know? And that's what this is. Uh, racism is unfortunately a part of life. And as Coach Barnes and the guys mentioned is, is this, is we tell our players all the time, okay, it's time to stop talking about it now, guys, and be about it. And that's where we have to get to. And that's what my conversation to my kids are from every topic, from gang violence to everything. We had a kid die on Foothills campus last year right across the street. Okay, let's talk about it. How do you come against it? My brother was 16 when he was murdered. Could have cried about it, my family could have cried about it, but if you go down Chester and 8th Street, man, I see big Wendell Davis Foundation. We're doing something about it. It's gotta do something about racism. Building relationships with your players, like Coach Gutierrez was saying, is just so huge. You know, when, when you have that relationship with them, when it's not even talking about basketball. You know, and like Coach Nixon was saying, just listening, just listen to them. You know, I, I, I have countless huddles where I go in and what play do you guys want? This is not a dictatorship. This is democracy. We're here to try to win at one common goal. So what play do you guys want? You know, and so outside of basketball, now we're having a bigger conversation. And if I can't listen to them inside the huddle, how am I going to listen to them outside of it? How am I going to hear what they have to say, what things they're dealing with in their personal life, in their home life, with everything that's going on in our world today? And just building those relationships and just letting them know that you care about them outside of basketball or outside of football is so huge. Building that relationship with them within the game has let them trust me outside of the game to where they know they can call me and talk to me about anything. I feel like things are changing just even having this conversation. So I appreciate you all greatly. And it's uplifting to know that you're moving the conversation forward for your athletes. But you all are coaches. So we're going to play a game like the game's on the line. So you got to take your best shot here. And I want to get to each of you. I want to know how has today's conversation changed you? 
And Coach Gutierrez, I will start with you. Um, I, I think for me, just learning just different perspectives, I think that's always something that uh, is, is, is good to hear. But, I mean, just hearing, I mean, as coaches, different things that – um, everyone's doing with their teams and, and ways to further this conversation. I think I'm going to take some things back that I can now apply to our program and to our team and um, hopefully further this conversation and, and make sure that we, we can help uh, uh, force some change in our community. Uh, one thing that I've definitely got from this is we have to be purposeful and even getting together. Uh, and then we have to be strategic in how we're absolutely uh, looking at what needs to happen, how it needs to happen, but we got to actually sit down, you know, put certain things away and be purposeful and then driving some tra some change. I just thank you for the seat at the table. Um, this alone has educated me and allowed me to listen to perspectives um, and to be around leaders of men and women that, uh, that have a voice that are driving this community to be a better place. I got a 17 year old daughter and a 15 year old son. And I know if these guys continue to do what they're doing, this is going to be a great place for them. And I love that fact that we get the chance and I get to be here to be a part of this. So thank you. We always kind of look at the glass half empty when we're kind of talking about these topics and subjects. And in order for us to continue to make the change, and we have made some changes, and things still have to continue to get better, I think we, in order for us to continue to get better, we got to start looking at the glass half full as well, too. Um, because it's really easy to go at to the bottom on this thing. If we're going to continue to rise to the top, we got to start looking at the glass half full. And with the gentlemen that are at this table, I think this is a great start, uh, using our voices, using our platform. Um, that we're able to use, especially with you uh, having this. This is really big to be able to use the platform to hopefully educate um, people here in Kern County and to open up more eyes. We know that sports going to continue to bring people together, but outside of sports, what we're going to talk about and the things that we need to do uh, to continue to make this a better place. In many times, as coaches, when we go into an administrative meeting, we sit at the table, but we don't actually have a voice. And I think that that's what the black community is pursuing. We just want to be heard. We want somebody to have sympathy and empathy, not giving anything out. And I'm thankful that we get a chance to express that. But two things that I uh, really gathered from this is, first of all, to know uh, that there's other people in this community that has a heart uh, for people in this community. And then the power of conversation, uh, just to sit at the table and talk and hear uh, not only what is being said, but the heart uh, that people are, uh, as these coaches are, and knowing that they are out there uh, uh, fighting and battling for not only their kids, but for justice. I'll close with this. I am so thankful as I watched the situation that Coach Brown was going through. And the determining factor for us, and I encourage all of us, we have athletic directors and principals and it's important that we watch and try to get them to join in the actions that need to be taken because they set in a so much more powerful position than we do. You know, I echo what the coaches have said and, you know, thank you for the opportunity. I know that uh, you and I have talked about this for several months and I know you're very passionate about it and I appreciate you I, because you're, you, in my opinion, are an example of, of change, you know, because you're willing to, you know, bring us all together to talk, <laughs> to have the conversation, which many um, are afraid just to start there. Um, the word that I actually take from this is, is, you know, from all the coaches is encouraging because now we can ask each other, we might be going through something with a with a player that that they can share ideas and we can bounce ideas off of each other to you know ultimately to get that young man that young woman to to be successful so um and and i think that we as well can continue to to lead the charge for all the other coaches in the area to make kern county um kern county is very well respected and now I think we can make it even more in other ways beyond, beyond sports. Make sure to flash that shirt. <laughs>
Oh, uh, that's why I got it on. <laughs> oh. How you doing? Why don't you flash that ring? Man? Oh, oh. <laughs> what ring? Let's go get what it ring? on. Uh, <laughs> they said kind of relax and have a little conversation. Uh, uh, I want one of those, okay? I didn't even notice those. You noticed those? I, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even know I had them on. <laughs> Just going off what Coach McCall was saying, the glass half full. The glass is half full right now because we're having a conversation. Mm. Racism has never died. This is the first time we've had a platform to mm -hmm. discuss it. Yes. So because we're having this conversation right now, the glass is half full. Mm -hmm. And you know, the next thing is just being around all these men who, who speak well and are educated and who are trying to make change has been a blessing, you know, and just being able to listen to everyone talk, you know, and it's been great and uh, thank you for everything. And what I got from this today is that we're all doing the right thing, um, but I want to encourage us that uh, the book I read says, do not grow, grow weary in doing good. Yeah. You know, don't get frustrated in doing good. Although some days it might look like it's bad, but you know, I just pray that COVID has re-energized us all as coaches. Cause if you like me, you, you were tired. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know what? The good Lord, good looking out on COVID. Now I'm ready to hit it again. You know, I'm ready to battle our biggest rival, BCHS again for another state championship. We got it first, they got it second. <laughs> but bigger than any championship is I know that there's other men and women around that is in this battle for, for together. Yeah. We're all in it together. I feel like I can call Liberty. Hey, Nixon, man, need some help over here at Foothill or... Uderares, Mike, you know, I know we're rivals, but hey, we need some help. We need to put something together. The college yeah. coaches, um, that part right there, just having the college coaches here. Yeah. Sometimes high school coaches don't feel like they can touch you, but you guys have all been different. You know, you go to CSUB and you can touch and smack hands <laughs> with you guys. And I can already see little John is, is back at it. So, you know, I'll just go back to the thing I got is there's men and women here that we're all fighting for the same cause and do not grow weary in doing good. Yeah, well with that, um, all I can truly say sincerely is thank you all for joining. You guys thanked me, but none of you hesitated to be here at this table and have this conversation and I just found it so important. But hopefully this makes an impact uh, for our community because that's what we're all here for. So as always, thank you for tuning in and hopefully having those open hearts and open minds to make a change in your community. But until next time, I'm Carrie Osset for 23ABC News. We'll see you then.